Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on maximizing memory. We're going to be covering memorization techniques today, and this is a good webinar to improve your overall general memory, but also for those situations where you really need to memorize maybe some very, very important details. So that's what we're going to be covering today. My name is Paul Novak. I'm the founder and CEO here at Iris Reading. And if you're not already familiar with the work that we do, we teach study skills to students and professionals. That ranges from teaching people speed reading techniques to, of course, memory techniques. We also teach courses on note taking and generally how to be more productive. We all want to get more time out of our day. So let's get right into it. We're going to be talking about maximizing memory. <clears throat> now, a little reminder, uh, we are streaming this live on YouTube. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, we'll be providing weekly videos that range on topics related to reading and literacy, being more productive, uh, note taking, and all of these things to basically help you get more out of your day. So subscribe at Iris Reading on YouTube. And our focus, generally speaking, is in these three areas. If we're going to be efficient as far as reading goes, we want to have a decent speed, but also comprehension and, of course, retention. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, when it comes to comprehension and retention, I want you to know there is a difference. Comprehension is what are you understanding the moment you're reading it? And retention is what do you remember later on? And sometimes your comprehension might be good at the moment, but you might forget things later. And that's a retention issue. In today's session, we're going to be focusing more so on this side of the equation. How do we remember the material well? Or in situations where we got to actually memorize. So I want to remind everyone that uh, the name of our organization, IRIS, is actually an acronym for an approach you would take to reading something comprehensively. And it has to do with inspecting the material first. So real quick, an overview of this. Most people don't do it when they read. But <clears throat> the idea of inspecting is basically getting familiar with something before you read it. It's very straightforward advice, but 95% of readers are not doing this. So when you're at the beginning of a chapter or a report or whatever it is you're reading, it's a good idea to kind of look through what am I getting myself into. Now, if this is a traditional chapter, I'm going to read the introduction, uh, the headings and subheadings. I'm just kind of flipping through my chapter, looking at all headings and subheadings, bold face words, things that are in italics, really anything that's jumping off the page. That includes pictures, diagrams, charts, but I'm not getting into the nitty gritty. I'm just getting, I'm going to read the titles of those charts and diagrams. <clears throat> Later when I read, I'll try to get the details as much as I possibly can. But the inspection is really just a, getting the top level general information first. And then when you read, that's step number two to get the details. And while we're reading, you might take notes of that, but when you're done reading, a quick thing you can do is to inquire about what you just read. When I say inquire, I mean ask questions. So questions can be like, all right, what are the biggest takeaways? What do I got to memorize? And that leads us to the step down here, store. How am I going to store this information? Now, let me back up a moment here. If you think about this, when you start reading the chapter or the report or whatever it happens to be, if you do this first, inspecting, what's going to happen to your reading speed when you read the material? You are, without a doubt, going to read it a little faster, right? What about your comprehension? If you do this first and you get familiar with your material first, you will have better comprehension. And that's the whole idea behind inspecting. And actually, I should mention one other thing because I know not everyone joining us today is you know, a traditional student. If you're just a working professional, you get to pick and choose what you want to read and not read. Sometimes inspecting the material is a good filter to figure out, okay, this is not worth my time. I already know about this topic. Or I inspected the material, I got the gist of it. That's enough to satisfy my purpose. So this can be a great way to save time when you just need to know high level general information. Now, when we need to get the nitty gritty detail, of course, you gotta read that material. And then when you're done, you ask questions. This kind of centers around your purpose in reading. Uh, maybe I have a quiz or a test coming up. I'm gonna be asking questions like, what's gonna be on the test? Or what do I gotta memorize? Sometimes I'm reading things because I'm reading and maybe I got to do a presentation on this topic. So I'm doing some reading and research to get some background on that. So I might read something and ask questions like, uh, okay, what from this chapter or from this material can I include in my presentation? 
Now, the storage step, this is where we try to actually memorize information, if there's anything to be memorized. I don't go through this whole process when I'm reading the news because when I'm reading the news, I don't have to memorize anything. I'm just reading the news because I want to know what's going on in the world. So I might just do this or these two steps. But when I need to remember information well, that's where, okay, we got to figure out how am I going to memorize information. So first things first, we all know that repetition helps you remember things. I'll repeat that. Repetition helps you remember things, <laughs> helps you to remember things. We, we all know that's true. Uh, I've got some musical imagery on the screen here because music is full of repetition, right? Isn't it true that uh, there are songs I could put on now that you have not heard in years, but you know the lyrics to the song, right? And that's kind of cool that you could remember the lyrics to the song, even though you haven't heard it in a long time. So that's the power of repetition. Actually, there are songs that you don't even like that you have memorized, right? I'm thinking Baby Shark. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the song's got like billions of views on YouTube. Actually, my daughter, when she was three years old, she kept listening to this over and over, and it was driving me crazy. And you remember the lyrics to songs because of repetition. If it's popular, it's played over and over again. So that's the power of repetition. Uh, by the way, this is somewhat experimental, doing a live stream like this on YouTube, and I think we're streaming also on uh, LinkedIn here. So welcome, everyone. I'm curious to know where you're joining us from, so you could let us know in the comments below. I am broadcasting from the Miami area. Uh, however, my hometown is Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago, and I moved about a year and a half ago to kind of escape the winter. I still love Chicago, but I live now in the Miami area. Let us know in the comments or the chat below where uh, where you're where you're uh, joining us from. And uh, repetition is just one part of the whole memory equation. Things that impact our memory, it's more than just repetition. Now, when it comes to reading, the way you can get your repetitions in, first off, I don't want to just read this chapter five times or 10 times for the sake of repetition. I want to read it once, and I want to read it and understand it as well as possible. So the way that you get your repetitions in is going to be a little different. You inspect first, that's a repetition. You read next, that's another repetition. And when you do this and this, these are all repetitions that help you to remember things. Also, if you're gonna take notes, that's extra repetition. Just the action of writing something down, even digital note-taking, that's a form of repetition and it ensures that you'll remember something a little better even if you never look at those notes again. It still benefits your brain that you took some notes. <clears throat> now, if you're looking for tips on how to go about taking notes. If you go to our website, irisreading.com, uh, we have a course that goes into a lot of depth on note-taking. You can check that out on the website. Actually, if you stick around to the end, I'll give you a code on how you can get a discount on any of the courses we have. But when you inspect, you take some notes, you read while you're reading, you take some notes, then you inquire, and then you store. Now, what else affects our memory? So there are various memory principles we need to be aware of besides just repetition. One of these memory principles is visualization. This is your brain's ability to see something that isn't necessarily there. I'll give you an example. If I tell you to imagine in your mind a family member, maybe a brother or a sister, or your mom or dad, you can picture them, right? Oh, hello, Rochelle from South Africa. Wow, thanks for joining us. Again, let us know in the chat or the comments below where you're joining us from, I'm curious. And uh, visualization, this idea is the ability to visualize something. Like if I said, visualize a cup of coffee, you can picture it, even though it might not be in front of you. I actually have one on the side here. I got a Starbucks cup of coffee. Um, but you can visualize these things even though they're not necessarily there. That's what psychologists would call your mind's eye. It's just your ability to see something that isn't there. We're gonna utilize visualization when we try to memorize things. We're actually gonna do a memorization exercise in a few moments here, but we're gonna take advantage of this. And keep in mind that this is the reason why you forget people's names, but you remember their faces. You may have forgotten my name already. I mentioned it at the beginning. My name's Paul, by the way. Oh, I see Sean from Ireland. Hello, Sean. Thanks for joining us. So you ever have this happen to you? You meet someone and you immediately forget their name. This can be extremely frustrating. I know it's happened to me. It's probably happened to you. 
It's happened to a lot of people. I want you to know this is not always a memory, memory issue. Oh, hello, Lisa from Arizona. This isn't always a memory issue. It's sometimes an attention issue. If uh, somebody told me their name and I wasn't paying attention, then I forgot their name. The reality is I didn't really receive it to begin with. I just kind of didn't pay attention. So it's not always a memory issue. So keep in mind when it comes to memory, first and foremost, most important thing is attention, paying attention, right? Now, your visual recall is much better than your verbal recall. Uh, visual recall, that's something like a logo, right? Verbal recall, that's like these letters that make up a name, McDonald's. Companies will always have visuals attached to their brand because visual recall is better. Now think about your short-term and your long-term memory. When you're trying to remember things, let's say uh, you have to make a grocery list. How many items would it take before you gotta make the list? Think about that for a moment. And let me know in the chat or in the comments below. We are recording this, so I understand not everyone's gonna be joining us live when they're watching this. But let us know in the comments, how many items would it take before you decide, you know what, I better write this down and make an actual list. Or I mean, in my case, I just make a list on my phone and I go. But I wouldn't make a list if I'm just getting one or two items. I could probably remember that, hopefully. How many does it take? I don't know, for me, it's like four or five. For some of you, it might be five or six or three or four. There's actually some research into this topic of uh, how many items before you'd have, like wh where does your short-term memory kind of hit like a wall or a ceiling? And it turns out uh, there's something called the magic number seven or Miller's magic number, it's seven. You ever wonder why phone numbers are seven digits in length? There's a reason for it. it has to do with your short-term memory. So there's this guy, his name's George Miller, and he wrote a paper back in 1952 called the magic number seven plus or minus two. And it had to do with this idea of short-term memory that we can remember about seven things plus or minus two in the short term before our memory, short-term memory basically falls off a cliff. So it's basically this graph that you see here, you know, one or two, three items from a grocery store I can remember. Once I get to around five, that's where I start feeling a little bit uneasy about my memory here. So that's a uh, Miller's magic number. Now, if you have 10 digits, that's why it's hard to remember 10 digits at once. Or imagine if you were introduced to somebody at a meeting, just one-on-one -on -one meeting. Hi, I'm Paul. You meet them, you could remember one name. What if you have uh, two different people in the meeting? Yeah, that's two people. There's a If you had 10 people in the meeting and you get each, introduced to each one, one by one, that's where you're like, okay, I'm not gonna be able to keep track of this. It's like information overload for your short-term memory. Same thing here. We have a three, a one, a two, a six, a seven, a nine, a four, a zero, a four, a five, a three. I mean, you could try to memorize this. I mean, if you were able to memorize all 10 of those digits right now, I'd be, I'd be somewhat impressed. But the idea here is that we've got some sort of a limit when it comes to our short-term memory. And let me give you another number here. If you look here, what's your impression of this right here? Well, this, you know, I could probably remember this if I stare at it long enough. Or if you look at these different numbers, look over here, we have a number in the billions. We have another number here without commas, the 10 digit number you saw before. And then we have this number down here that looks like a phone number. Which of these is easiest to memorize if we had to? I think all of us would agree the bottom one would be the easiest, right? Because it looks like a phone number, it's broken up into parts. It's a little easier on our brain when things are set up that way. So two very important things going on here. One is something called chunking. How'd you learn to spell the word Wednesday? Right, you broke it down, right? Like wed -ness day wed -ness day but it's pronounced Wednesday. That's called chunking. Sometimes they call it chunking, clustering, grouping, all the same idea. When you chunk things in parts, it's easier for your brain to remember. But again, this thing on the bottom here, these digits, it looks like a phone number. That's called association. We associated this 10-digit string of numbers as a phone number. And also you could associate the area code if you know what that is. That's a Chicago area code. By the way, don't dial this number. It's just uh, totally made up. But the idea here is, and actually if you look at these numbers long enough, aren't they all the same? But what is different? The formatting, right? 
this is hard to remember at the top. 3,126,794,053. That's hard. Okay. This right here, 3, 1, 2, 6, 7, 9, 4, 0, 4, 3, 5, 3. Uh, okay. This right here is easiest because it's just broken up 3, 1, 2, 6, 7, 9, 40, 53. That's chunking. 40, 53. That's chunking an association that helps it to be easier to remember. Now, there's some something else that's involved with psychology that demonstrates this idea of association really well called the Baker Baker effect. And this is a really interesting study. They take two groups of people and in one group, they're introduced to some guy named Mr. Baker. The point of the study is they wanna see how many people remember his name. So they don't tell everybody that's the point of the study. Otherwise it would kind of skew the results. They tell them the studies about something else. They get introduced to Mr. Baker. They're told his name. And when they get brought back later on and they asked individually, what do you remember about that person you met? Almost everybody forgets his name, Mr. Baker. It's usually like 90% or more of people forgetting the name. So if you feel bad about forgetting names, don't people forget names all the time? By the way, if you want to get better at remembering names, we actually have a course on our website on the topic of remembering names. You can check that out. It's one of our micro uh, short courses there. But the name here, most people forget. What's interesting about this study is group number two. They get introduced to the same guy, but they're told he's a baker. So this is the Baker Baker effect. When they're told that this person is a baker, when they get brought back and asked, what do you remember about that person that you met in the study? Almost everybody remembers that he was a baker. Now he's not dressed like a baker, but we basically, the reason why this is hard to remember, Mr. Baker, and this is easy to remember, a baker, it's because we already have associations in our brain related to a baker. How do you picture a baker, right? A certain kind of a look, maybe a top hat, apron. There's all sorts of things associated with a baker. You might think of bread, cakes, all these things. So that's why this is easier to remember. And that's what they call the baker baker effect. It's all about association. Now there's one other thing that really affects your memory in a large way. And this is very, very important. You remember things that are weird. Anything that's strange, exaggerated, out of the ordinary is much more memorable. So this is kind of crucial. And actually, if you think about companies that run ads and you see these TV commercials or maybe not on TV, you might see them on YouTube, but wherever you see them, they're purposely made sometimes to be exaggerated. Not sometimes, a lot of times. Uh, that's why McDonald's at some point in their corporate history decided to use a clown to help sell cheeseburgers. I imagine that marketing meeting years ago. They're like, all right, everybody, we need ideas. How are we going to sell more cheeseburgers? And somebody in that meeting was probably drunk. Was like, ah, oh, how will we have a you know sell use a clown? And someone was like, you know what? That's just crazy enough that that might work. Um, anyway, so this at some point was. Uh, utilized, but McDonald's is not the only one group that uses this. I mean, if I told you Geico, what do you think of Geico? You now, if you're in the U.S. and you've seen their many, many commercials, uh, you see this talking gecko, right? Within, I think it has an Australian or British accent. That's purposely done by design. I went to the, mo I went to the movies recently, and before the movie started, before the trailers started, there were some advertisements uh, for Coca-Cola. One of the best brands, one of the most well-known brands in the world, Coca-Cola. And there were these polar bears drinking Coke. Now that doesn't make any sense, right? If you're wondering why polar bears are on the brink of extinction, maybe it's because they're drinking too much Coke. Uh, but again, it doesn't make any sense. And actually polar bears are not cute and cuddly. If you saw a polar bear, you'd like, you'd, you'd wanna run or you'd throw a chair at it because those things are, are deadly, okay? They will rip us to pieces, okay? Uh, Lisa says, and the cheeseburglar. Yes, I remember Grimace and the cheeseburglar. Exactly, you know what I'm talking about. All these characters, I mean, when you watch Super Bowl commercials, everybody is trying to make you laugh, something ridiculous. It's all done on purpose. Let's take advantage of that. And we're going to learn how to store right now with a little exercise. We're gonna take some sample uh, material here. You see this book, uh, Brain Rolls? Uh, this book, it's about 300 pages. Uh, let's say you read through it and now you gotta memorize the brain rolls. They're over here. 
And you see here the subtitles, 12 Principles for Surviving and Thriving at Work, Home, and School. A pretty good read if you're interested in it. Um, but let's say you're done with the book and you got to memorize it. You got to remember that exercise is number one, survival is number two. Maybe you got to memorize these in order. Wiring is number three, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, sleep, stress, sensory integration, vision, music, exploration. Got it? Okay, maybe not. That's our first exposure to the information. Now, if we got to memorize this, one way to do it, I guess, is, uh, I don't know, I could write it down a bunch of times, or I could uh, I could just keep repeating it. Exercise, survival, wiring, attention, short-term memory, long-term memory, sleep, stress, sensory integration, vision, music, exploration. That takes a lot of effort if I'm just going to repeat over and over again. Also, that's a very boring way to study. They sometimes call it rote memorization. There's a better way. Repetition's important, but we want to combine it with other things that can improve our memory. Like we said, visualization, association, exaggeration. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a technique called the numeric peg system. I absolutely love this memory technique because it's so easy to learn and people pick it up quickly and it's easily deployable. So we're going to use it right now. Here's the idea. The numeric peg system is all about taking numbers and pegging them to visuals. When I say peg, I mean associating them to visuals. So you just got to memorize 10 numbers for this to work well. All right. So the numbers, every number is going to get a visual. Number one is going to be a pencil. Okay. I need you to commit that to memory right now. One is a pencil. And if you're wondering why, it's just because it has the same shape as a one. Okay or a similar shape. Okay, number two is a swan. Do you see how they share a similar shape, the two and a swan? I want you to memorize two is a swan. I promise this is gonna come in handy in a little bit, and you only gotta memorize 10 digits. Three is McDonald's. You gotta turn your head sideways for this one. Three is McDonald's. All right, four is a chair. I know some people make their fours like this. I make my fours like that. Uh, but this is just an upside down chair. You see the seat over here? That's a seat. There's the backrest. So you see how that would be a chair. So when I tell you four, you got to think chair. I am going to quiz you on this in a moment here. Five is a hook. Do you see the similar shape here? You see the curvy part of the five right here? You see the curvy part of this hook? The orientation doesn't matter. So the hook is upside down in this case. The chair is upside down here. You just got to think of chair. And five, you got to think hook. Okay. Now, if we did a little review, you could probably get them, right? Number one is what? Oh, yeah, the pencil. How about number two? Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah, number two is swan. How about number three? Do you remember that? That's McDonald's. Number four, the chair. And number five, the hook. Okay, let's move on to six through ten, and then we're going to apply this technique. Six is a cherry. Now, you see the six, how it has like a cherry here, and this is like the stem. Six is going to be a cherry. Seven is going to be a lightning bolt. So when I say seven, you got to think of lightning. You see seven, there's a seven right over here. There's another seven over here. The seven looks like lightning. Eight is a racetrack, even though it'd be kind of weird if they made racetracks with intersections, but just, just imagine eight as a racetrack. Nine is a balloon. Okay, so you see the balloon up here, and then there's a little string coming down. Nine looks like a balloon. Ten is a play setting. So when I say setting, I mean a plate or a bowl, whatever you want, plate or a bowl, and some silver on the side. It could be a spoon or a fork or chopsticks, but you see a one here, a one and a zero to represent ten, a play setting. Okay, quick little quiz, number six. When you think of the number six, what are you thinking of? Probably a cherry, right? How about number seven? You think of seven and you're like, hmm, oh yeah, seven is lightning. How about number eight? Eight. Oh yeah, that's my uh, racetrack, right? How about number nine? Do you remember nine? Balloon. And 10, what is that? The play setting. Okay, got them all. Great. Let's move on and work on how we're going to apply this because we got topics that we need to remember that could be practically anything but in our example we're going to use these topics right here we got to remember exercise survival wiring attention short-term memory long-term memory sleep stress sensory integration vision music exploration the way it's going to work is each topic has to be associated 
to its respective visual. And these topics have to be associated in a visual way and exaggerated. When I say exaggerated, I mean let's make the images kind of weird because we know the way our brain works will remember something, well, more likely to remember it if it's weird. So for exercise, I'm going to give you the images just for the sake of time here so you can picture them on your own. If you were doing this on your own, of course, you would come up with your own images, but this is just to give you an idea. And also, it'll move things along faster because this is just one of the techniques. There are numerous memorization techniques, and I want to go through more than one. So for exercise, here's what I want you to imagine. When I say imagine, I want you to, like, you could either close your eyes and think about what would that look like, or you don't have to close your eyes. You can kind of just kind of, some people look up and to the left or right. And they're like, hmm, what would that look like? Exercise, imagine going to the gym. There's a brand new gym that opens up in your neighborhood. And this gym, you notice everybody's working out with pencils, okay? There's somebody doing curls with a pencil, someone else on the bench press with a pencil, someone doing like the shoulder press with a pencil. Imagine this very strange gym that you've signed up for. Maybe you are regretting signing up for this gym now, but imagine how confused you would be if you went to a gym where everyone's working out with pencils. That's how we're gonna remember exercise. Let's move on to number two. We gotta remember survival. The number two is a swan. I want you to imagine a swan that is struggling for survival and that it's drowning. Okay, the swan is drowning. It doesn't know how to swim. That doesn't make any sense because swans should kind of have a default setting of knowing how to swim. Just imagine this swan doesn't know how to swim. It's drowning. Maybe you feel bad for the poor swan. You jump into the lake to try to save it. Imagine all that chaos. That's how we're going to remember number two for survival. By the way, this isn't the only image we could come up with, right? Like uh, survival, I don't know, what does that remind you of? For me, also reminds me of like uh, that quote, survival of the fittest. gets sometimes attributed to Charles Darwin, even though I don't think that's a precise quote of what he said. But anyway, let's say we go the Charles Darwin route. If you know what he looked like in his older years, he had this massive glorious beard and a bald head. I would picture Charles Darwin riding a swan around a lake. But again, that only works if you make that connection to, oh, survival, survival of the fittest, Charles Darwin, and so on. Or we could just go the route of there's a swan and it's drowning, struggling for survival. Okay, let's move on to three. The number three is McDonald's. Three, what we got to remember and memorize is wiring. I want you to imagine you go to McDonald's and uh, you, even if you don't like McDonald's, just pretend you go to McDonald's and you order a Big Mac and you bite into it and there's a piece of barbed wire in your Big Mac. Imagine the pain of biting into something with barbed wire in it. Also, imagine how angry or, and disgusting that would be. The reason I want you to imagine how angry you would be, how disgusting that would be, how painful that would be, is because your emotions also play a part in how you remember things. If you get yourself riled up and angry or imagine being disgusted or imagine the pain, all of that could actually help you to remember, oh, three is wiring. I remember those emotions of being angry So, and the ensuing lawsuit. So wiring is number three. Big Mac with barbed wire. I got to remember three is wiring. Four, I got to remember attention. Now, the number four is a chair. I want you to imagine a chair that helps you pay attention. You see this chair right here with the hands? Imagine you get one of these, and every time you're watching like a webinar like this and you're not paying attention, maybe you're checking your email in another tab, it just kind of taps you on the shoulder like, hey, pay attention to Paul's webinar. Okay, or whatever it is you're trying to pay attention to. <laughs> okay, so number four is attention. I gotta remember, okay, that's a chair that helps me pay attention. That's how we'll remember number four. How about number five? Five is short-term memory. The image for five is a hook. Okay, hooks, I don't know about you, but hooks remind, a hook reminds me of uh, pirates. I'm going to go the pirate route here. And uh, I got to remember short-term memory. If you look ahead, you'll see six is long-term memory. So I just need something that's going to distinguish between short and long. I want you to picture some very short pirates like this, okay? But there's a bunch of them. There's like 20 of them on a beach. So there's 20 pirates, all baby or toddler, short, short pirates. They all have shovels. They're digging for their buried treasure. Uh, they buried it last night. The problem is they can't remember where they buried it. 
because they have short-term memory problems. Okay. So notice how I'm really doubling up on the whole short idea here. They're short pirates with short-term memory problems. That's because I got to remember five is short-term memory. Now, if you have to remember these things, you already know probably how you're going to backtrack, right? You're going to think about the number one, and the image for number one is pencil, and that's probably enough for you to remember what topic number one was. Oh, yeah, exercise, right? The gym where people were working out with pencils. Very good. I see Lisa says Captain Hook. Exactly. You can imagine Captain Hook there as well. Number two is the swan. Oh, yeah. What was going on with the swan? It was drowning, remember? Maybe you got to jump in to save it. Number two, the swan was struggling for survival, right? That's number two. And you think about number three, that's easy, right? Three is McDonald's. Oh, right. I went to McDonald's, there was a Big Mac, there was barbed wire in my Big Mac. Three is wiring. Same idea with number four. You think about the chair. Four is a chair. Oh, right, the chair with the, with the hands that help you pay attention, right? Four is attention. And uh, we just did number five, five's the hook. That hopefully is enough to remind you of pirates, short pirate, short-term memory. Okay, so I think you get the idea. So we're going to go a little faster through the rest of them. Six is long-term memory. The number six is represented by a cherry. So I want you to picture a cherry with a ridiculously long stem, okay? Maybe it's like two or three feet in length. Imagine how confused you would be if you found a cherry with a really, really long stem. Of course, we gotta remember long-term memory. Notice this has nothing to do with memory. We're just using long to trigger enough memory to recall long-term memory. Seven, sleep. Now the seven is lightning, right? Seven is lightning. For sleep, I want you to imagine uh, you get a you get an alarm clock that gets has a special feature. You know the snooze button when you hit snooze. This snooze button, when you hit snooze, you get zapped by lightning, okay? And it's to provide a disincentive to hitting snooze too often, okay? And that's all related to sleep. So that's how we'll remember sleep. Seven is lightning. The snooze button while we're sleeping, maybe we accidentally hit it. We get zapped by lightning. It wakes us up. That's all related to sleep. Eight. We got to remember stress. Now, the number eight, remember we said that looks like a racetrack. Even though, I mean, I told you they probably wouldn't make racetracks with intersections like this. Imagine they did. Okay, so every time those race car drivers go across the intersection, they're, of course, stressed out that they might crash into another car. And that's very stressful. I want you to imagine them sweating they are really stressed about potentially crashing. Okay, number eight is stress. Nine is a balloon, right? You gotta remember sensory integration. Sensory integration, how are we gonna remember that? Well, you might think this is a little harder because it's a more vague term, but you gotta visualize it. Keep in mind sensory integration, this chapter is actually all about your five senses and don't your five senses have visuals associated with them, right? These visuals you see here, your ability to taste, right? Your sense of uh, hearing and smell and touch and your ability to see all five body parts. We got to associate these with a balloon. So I want you to picture a very, very large balloon. And this balloon, inside the balloon, there are five body parts floating around in this large balloon. There's a nose in there, an ear, a hand, a a tongue, an eyeball. Don't picture this cartoony image. Picture what like a real balloon filled with actual body parts would look like. The more weird you make it, the better. That's how we're gonna remember sensory integration, okay? All right, vision is number 10. How are we gonna remember this? Well, this is a play setting, right? The number 10 is a play setting. Remember I said it could be a plate or a bowl. So a one and a zero. So that could be a spoon, a fork, plate, or a bowl. We got to associate to vision. I think you probably know where I'm going to go with this image, right? What should we put in the plates or in the bowl? Let's fill it with eyeballs. Okay, imagine a plate or a bowl filled with eyeballs. What would that look like? It wouldn't look like this. And don't picture this caricature. I think this, these eyeballs would be a little moist, kind of bloody, right? Imagine. Um, the optic nerve still attached. Or, or imagine they had these eyeballs have eyelids on them and one of them winks at you, like you know, kind of 
put off by that. So the more creepy, the more gory you make this, the easier it will be to remember. By the way, memory researchers have a name for what we're doing here. They call it elaborative encoding. So elaborative encoding is just a fancy set of words for if you want to remember something, create a weird image in your brain and you're more likely to remember it. But you, in academia, you can't really call this the principle of ridiculousness. Um, instead, you get elaborative encoding. Ah, Lisa says Jeffrey Dahmer, serial killer, number nine, scary. That's right, you can go that route, exactly. I, li I like where you're going with this. The more, the more disturbing you make these images, the better, okay? Number six through 10, if you gotta recall them, how are we gonna do it? Oh yeah, six, that's the cherry. What's that remind you of? Oh yeah, the cherry with the long stem, right? long-term memory. When you think about number seven, that is the lightning bolt, and that seven is lightning. Do you remember the alarm clock, right, and getting zapped by lightning when you hit snooze? That's related to sleep. Number seven is sleep. How about number eight? When you think about the number eight, oh yeah, number eight, that's the racetrack. Oh yeah, stress is number eight, right? You see how we're backtracking. Basically, the images we came up with for the number they're serving as clues to help us remember what we had to remember. Number nine, so eight was stress. Nine is the balloon. Oh yeah, we're thinking of that uh, that Jeffrey Dahmer imagery that Lisa mentioned, or the, the the body parts inside of a balloon. The body parts representing your five sensory integration. And then number ten is the bowl or the plate. Oh yeah, filled with eyeballs. Vision, right? We still got 11 and 12. You might have more than 12 things to remember. What if you got to remember 15 or 20? Let me explain how you can scale this system up. And it's not what you might be thinking. Some people think, okay, for 11, I guess I'll just use a pe two pencils, a pencil and a pencil. Or for 12, I'll use a pencil and a swan. No, don't do that. Here's why. Um, if you used a pencil and a swan for 12, uh, what happens when you have to get to 21? Hmm. Now you got a swan and a pencil, and that's where your memories might get a little crisscrossed. So we, we don't want that. So here's what we're going to do. For 11, to remember music, you got to create a rule. We need rules, okay? Or a theme, however you want to think of it. And these rules or this theme is going to apply to all the numbers 11 through 20. So what's the rule going to be? It can be whatever you want. The rule that I use is snow but it doesn't have to be snow. Your rule could be rain. It could be, it doesn't have to be weather related. It can be, I don't know, a book related rule, books or babies or celebrities or cars, whatever you want. The idea is that you apply this rule for 11 through 20. So let's just go with this example of snow. I want you to imagine for 11, we got to use a pencil and here's why 11 has a pencil in it right here. And I know we used it for exercise, but the difference here is that we're going to use a pencil in conjunction with snow and in conjunction with the topic, whatever that happens to be. 12, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use a swan. We're going to use snow and the topic. What are the topics you see right here? Music is 11. Exploration is number 12. So let's uh, let's focus on music first. So for this, we need three elements to our visual that we create. We need a pencil, snow, and music. For music, when you think of music, what's it remind you of? For me, it reminds me of like a composer, you know, the composer with uh, his or her baton. Um, I'm going to picture that as a large pencil. You see this large pencil. Imagine a composer outside in blizzard-like condition composing music with an orchestra in front of him or her. Uh, think of it as, actually, I'm from Chicago. That's my hometown. And there's a great park there called Millennium Park, and they have this great music venue, which is outdoors. And in the summer, you can go there and listen to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra practicing. So you can go there, have a picnic. It's a really great experience. But imagine, you know, there's a composer, and instead of a, what do they call it, a baton, I think they call it. Instead of the regular baton, they're using a large pencil, okay? That's how we're gonna remember music. And of course, it's snowing like crazy. It's not summertime. Chicago snows like half the year or like a third of the year. So picture that for music. 12. We're going to use swan, snow, and 
exploration. Some imagery related to exploration. Tell me in the chat or in the comments below, what do you think of when you think of exploration? Exploration equals what for you? For me, I think of space exploration. That's the first thing that pops into my mind. So I should go that route when I'm creating my image. But when you create this image on your own, you might go a different route. So exploration reminds me of space exploration. For others, some of you, it might remind you of, uh, I don't know, exploring the ocean or exploring a jungle or travel also reminds me of, a, it's a form of exploration when you travel somewhere new. Uh, exploration also reminds me of Indiana Jones or Dora the Explorer. So there's all sorts of images we can come up with for exploration. Now, the first one that popped into mind for me was space exploration. So I go that route. So I need swan and snow involved with space. So I'm going to picture a giant swan-shaped spaceship. And this swan-shaped spaceship, it's hard to say, swan-shaped spaceship, uh, it's going through space. I need snow involved. So let's, let's make it snow. We're not going to make it rain. We're going to make it snow. Okay, so it's snowing in outer space. I know that makes no sense. Just go with it. Okay, it's weird. We're more likely to remember something that's weird. So there's a giant swan shaped spaceship with this kid astronaut and it's snowing. It's a blizzard out there in outer space. That's how I'm going to remember space, well, exploration, not space exploration. So if you had to quiz yourself, you can probably get all 12. Actually, I'm going to do a little quiz for you right here. And, uh, Here's the thing, I want you to write on a notepad numbers one through 12, but leave them blank. You gotta pause the video, feel free. But here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna call out a number, any one of these numbers, one through 12, and I want you to fill in the blank. I'm gonna go out of order just to make it a little more challenging for you. Now, I'm gonna tell you the number and then you gotta write it down. So if you want a longer pause between these things to sit and think about it, just pause the video. But I'm gonna give a subtle pause and then I'll tell you the answer, okay? So let's start with uh, number three. Write down number three. You could also tell me in the chat or in the comments below if you wanna write them all out in the comments, you can do that. Test your memory here. Number three, hmm. oh yeah, three. The image for the number three is McDonald's. So that's basically your clue. So if you get lost, just think about what was going on with McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. Oh yeah. At some point it will hit you, hopefully. Three is McDonald's. There was a Big Mac with barbed wire on it. Oh yeah, wiring is number three. Okay. What about number eight? Write down number eight or type it out in the comments or chat or write it down on your sheet of paper. Eight. Eight's our racetrack. Yeah, that intersection, right? The stress is number eight. How about, uh, watch this. Here's the cool thing about this technique. I could go backwards and you'll know. I'm gonna tell you the title of the chapter and you're gonna know exactly what number or where it goes, hopefully. Sensory integration. Sensory integration. Do you remember what number that was? All right, write it down. How about uh, short-term memory? Where does that go? What chapter number was that? All right, we got them, very good. How about, let's see here. Let's jump to number 10. Number 10, write down number 10. And it's easy when you know how the system works, it kind of makes it easier, right? So number 10 is the plate or the bowl. Oh, yeah. By the way, for short-term memory, that was the hook, right? With pirates, five is the hook. Um, stress was number eight. Ten, we just did that one. Vision. How about number one? Write down number one. Let's see if you got that one. Number one was pencil. That reminds you of, oh, yeah, people working out with pencils. Exercise is obviously number one. How about number seven? Write down number seven. Seven is lightning. Hopefully that's enough to remind you of the topic of sleep, right? Getting struck by lightning when you hit snooze. How about number 12? Remember, snow is involved and 12 has a two in it. That's the swan. So swan and snow are your clues. What was going on with swan, snow for number 12? You said exploration, very good. 
How about number four? Write down number four. Four is, of course, the chair. Oh, yeah, that chair with the hands, the, that's attention, right? Number two, write down number two. Two is the swan. We're almost done here. Two, of course, was survival. Number 11. Remember, snow is involved and pencil is involved. Snow and pencil. Ah, that's right. That is, uh, remember, the composer with the pencil and the blizzard, and it's all related to music. Okay, last one, number six. Write down number six if you can remember it. That's right, six is a cherry, and that reminds you of long-term memory, the cherry with the long stem. So if you got it, great. Here's the thing. If you had to remember more than 20 things, you just make another rule. If you got to remember more than 30 things, make another rule. The rule could be pretty much anything you want. So the rule that I use for 21 through 30 is fight. There has to be a fight going on. So that leads to all sorts of outrageous imagery. So you can make another rule, and your rules can be whatever you want. I mean, I gave you the example of snow, but you can make it however you want. Now, here's the other thing. This little quiz that I did, if you memorized all 12, great. See if you can remember later on today or tomorrow. You'll be surprised that you still remember all or most of them. But if you forgot some of them, no big deal, because you could always review again if you had a test coming up. Or, well, here's the other thing you got to keep in mind. I gave you my images. If you did your own images, it would be even easier because they're your images that you came up with. So keep that in mind as well. There is another memory technique I want to cover before we wrap up today. I'll just cover it really quickly. And this is an ancient Greek method. The ancient Greeks had a method for memorizing information called the memory palace. It's also sometimes referred to as the method of loci. Basically what you do is you take a location you're familiar with, like your home, and you do a walkthrough of your home, and every location gets associated with whatever you gotta remember. So what kind of walkthrough of the home, how should, be, how should it be structured? So basically, think of it this way. When you get back home from uh, work or school, what is location number one? Maybe it's the front door. It doesn't have to be the front door. It could be the driveway. Maybe before you get to uh, your front door, maybe you uh, go to your mailbox first. Number one could be mailbox. So you pick a number one, and then you pick a number two. What's after location number one? Maybe it's uh, the closet where you put your shoes and jacket. Uh, what about number three? Maybe it's the hallway leading to the kitchen. You never repeat a location in this system. Then it might be the dining room, the living room, bedroom, bathroom, the other bedroom, the yard. We can keep going. You don't have to just go with 10. You can have as many locations as you need. Or another way to think of it, your walkthrough of the home could be different. It could be based on your morning routine. You know, when you wake up, number one could be the bedroom. Number two could be the closet. Number three could be bathroom, hallway, kitchen, dining room. Now you're leaving through your front door. You're going to work or school. So maybe then you get in the car or you jump on the bus or train. What's the next location? It could be the first street that you encounter. And then you continue on from work. Oh, Lisa mentions that this one is awesome. I was told this one in school. Yes, it's a shame that people don't learn about this. When I do courses in person, uh, kind of workshops that we do at companies and schools, and I ask how many people are familiar with this approach, the memory palace? 90% of people are not familiar with it, but we get about 10% that are familiar with it. It's, had a, it's starting to get more popular, which is good. And we're trying to popularize it because this is, although it's old, uh, they would say like it's old but gold. This technique's over, it's a few thousand years old. So what you do is, let's say, I'll give you a hypothetical example here. You gotta remember something in related to technology. Your memory palace is the home. The first five locations are these, and so on. Let's say these are the first five things you gotta remember. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, and let's say the list goes on. Maybe you gotta remember the top 10 or the top 20 largest tech companies in the US. By the way, I just made up this list. Um, this is not necessarily in order. Although I think Apple is number one in terms of largest tech company in the US, if you do it based on 
market capitalization. Anyway, so for Apple, if you have to remember Apple is number one, we need images for Apple. There's a lot of images we could use, right? We could use actual Apples, iPhones, laptops. Uh, Apple, for me, reminds me of uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, Steve Jobs, he died, he, he passed away a few years ago. I would imagine if number one was my mailbox, I'd imagine opening my mailbox and uh, the ghost of Steve Jobs flies out of my mailbox. Kind of like a genie out of a bottle. Maybe he grants me three wishes. Uh, Amazon, if that's number two, I would picture, maybe I picture a giant box from Amazon on my front door. Or uh, Amazon also reminds me of the founder of Amazon. Maybe it's Jeff Bezos delivering a box to me from Amazon. That'd be kind of weird if Jeff Bezos was at my front door. Uh, number three is Facebook. Let's say that's the case and I got to associate that to the stairway. I would imagine, you know, I walk into my home and sitting on my stairway is the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. He's, you know, he's on his phone. He's like, oh, hey, Paul. And I'm like, Mark Zuckerberg, why have you violated my privacy yet again by breaking into my home? So again, remember I told you about emotions. If you could get yourself riled up and angry, that can all help with your memory. Uh, for Twitter, I'd picture bluebirds uh, flying around the living room. You get the idea. We need an image for every one of these things we need to remember. And the cool thing about this technique that is very, very beneficial is it can help you remember details, okay? So if you gotta remember details about Twitter and Facebook, what if I gotta remember five things about Amazon? These six important things about Apple, these three crucial details about Twitter. The way you handle details is every detail has to be visualized and put in three areas of the living room. So you can use three objects in your living room, like, a, I don't know, I would use the, uh, the couch, the coffee table, the TV. If I got to use more areas, I mean, we could use the walls, the windows, maybe there's a painting, a lamp, the rug, the ceiling. You get the idea. And if you have to memorize these details in order, all you do is when you picture it and you're trying to recall, you go in a clockwise manner around your living room or whatever location you happen to be in. So the, the other benefit here of the memory palace is that you can use multiple locations. Your home is not the only location you're familiar with. What about where you go to school or where you went to school? What about your workplace or your former workplace? Or what about grandma's place, your friend's place? This comes in handy because there are situations where you got to remember a lot of things at once. Uh, I'll give you an example when you're studying for finals and you got finals week coming up. What if you have to remember a bunch of different things for a variety of classes? Well, then we need to have various memory palaces to remember this and that. One memory palace, one location could be for my history class. The other location could be for my anatomy class or my physics class. So this is like using a mental file cabinet. And this is a great way to memorize a lot of detailed information. So now there's other memory techniques. We don't have to, we don't have time to cover all of them. If you want to dive deeper into memorization or speed reading or any of these topics, go to the website. Uh, if you go to irisreading.com slash courses, and I'll put the link in the chat here, but you see it on the screen. We've got courses addressing all of these topics, comprehension, Note-taking, if you want to dive deeper into memory, we have an advanced comprehension and memory course that you can check out. There's a note-taking course. Uh, you might be familiar with some of the basic forms of note-taking, but there are some unique forms you might not be aware of. There's also a personal productivity course. If this is just, I think of all of these topics as making us more productive, you can take any one of these courses and just use the code Paul, that's my name, uh, to get 30% off. So if you're interested in that, feel free to check it out. Or if you want to invite us to your company or your organization or school, feel free to reach out. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're going to be updating content there uh, weekly. We've been getting some uh, good positive feedback from these live streams, so we're probably going to do more of these. So feel free to subscribe there. And if you have any questions, feel free to keep in touch. I've got my email on the screen here. Also, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, feel free to shoot me a connection request. Just let me know you were in the session. And if you want to connect on Instagram, you can see I'm just at Paul G. Novak right over there. Thank you all so much for attending. I hope you found today's session helpful. See if you can still memorize, remember those brain rules later on. And like I said, if you're interested in other topics uh, and you want to take some of those advanced courses, 
go to the website where you can find them. That's I, I've taught all these courses myself, so you can check out those courses there. Thank you all so much for attending. Have a great rest of the day. Take care.